ตาซานิโบนาดิมาชิโลดคุยมอร์กุดมอนโมลเวเอชาดาเอนาเว Welcome all of you to One Hope Baptist Church to all the families that have come by far to come and witness we welcome you the grandparents we welcome you the aunties we welcome you and the uncles and umpagati w o n k e welcome this morning mine is just a privilege to stand in front of you and to open God's word for us please with that said Let's open the book of Mark, the tenth chapter. Mark ten. Mark ten. Mark ten. We'll be reading from verses thirteen to sixteen. I've entitled my message. Children and childlikeness are acceptable in the kingdom of God. Children and childlikeness are acceptable in the kingdom of God. Let me read for us. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. And said to them, "Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it." And he took them in his arms and he blessed them, and laying his hands on them. It's a simple text. All of us have known it. It's a text that most people, whenever that they think about what God thinks, they come to this text. What God thinks about children. There is another parallel text. If you go to Matthew 19:13 to 15, and if you go to Luke 18 verses 15 to 17, as part of the synoptic gospel, synoptic means the same. They also. Zone in on this issue because, indeed, we do want to know what Christ thinks about children. Because it doesn't matter what we think; what is crucial is what does He think. But let's go to our text so that we can see what is happening. First, if you and I are to think and understand how does Christ think of children, look at verse thirteen. He accepts them. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. Children are acceptable because the parents, when they were bringing, when it says bringing, it means they were constantly bringing the children to Jesus. They could not resist Jesus' attraction, and thus they sought company for their children. And when he talks about children, we're talking about babies. He talks in the book of Luke. When Luke writes it, he speaks of they were bringing babies. Oh, they were bringing also their infants. Means they could not stop coming to Jesus because why? They had access to him. He was just open to receive them. And the children, when they came to him, the parents could do nothing else but to say. Look at the purpose. Why? That he might touch them, and in touching them, what we'll know is they would do so because Matthew says because he wanted them, he wanted they wanted him to pray for them. So in essence, he says the physical touch was there. What is the central idea? The idea is this: by now, Jesus is not aloof to us children. They are acceptable to come before Him, but look at again what happens. Though there is not there, you can look at it, and there is a but. What happens? Those who are close to Jesus, what do they do? They rebuke their parents. 
They are censuring them. They are saying they must be kept away. These are nothing else but Jesus' own disciples. Those who had lived with him. Those who had seen him. Those who had heard as he taught. Because what is the problem by now? The disciples were culture-centered. They were rooted in their culture. And because of their culture, their culture made them to be gatekeepers to those who would come before Christ. They were being dictated to by their social structures that said if and when the children are to be brought to a high-ranking rabbi, children are not to be seen. I'm saying they were near to Christ, but they were far away. So what you can understand, unlike Christ, they were centering the children. And we're saying the reason why it is because they are culture and socially structured. Here's a point I need you to understand all for all of us. Theology matters. Theology matters. We always act in line of what we think about God. Because our thoughts should always thoughts are always driven. By beliefs. Our thoughts or our theologies could either be genuine or they could be deviant or they could be false. What we are seeing about the disciples, they had a deviant theology. All of us have a theology. The reason why you act in the way that you act is because of the theology that you hold. No, but pastor, I'm not a theologian. You are a theologian. The way that you think about God is how you act. For those who do not know God, they act the way that they want to. Because they think they are a law unto themselves. No one can come and tell them what to do. Some, like the, some like the disciples, are rooted in their culture. Their culture is the one that dictates how they should act. What is acceptable or unacceptable? To the disciples, children were nothing else but those who are weak, those who are unworthy, and those who are insignificant, meaning they are nobodies. They are saying their children were not fit to come into the presence of their master. What's shocking by now, if you look into the context, the context tells you in chapter 10 from verses 1 to verses 12 what Mark writes about. You know it's a story that is familiar, right? He asked when they come to Christ, they ask him about divorce. So what Mark wants to bring to your attention and to our attention is family matters to God. And the intactness of the family matters to God. And then in the context itself, if you go beyond that, then you find the story of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler thought he could then come before Christ and come and bring merits so that he can be able to enter into the kingdom of God. He wanted to be part of God's family, but he's on, in his own way. But let's go back to our text so that we can see how then does Jesus react? Because how Jesus reacts, it's a contrast to how his disciples acted. Look at the text, it says, but when Jesus saw it. Total contrast. Because unlike them, who were those who were censuring, he then becomes, he was indignant. Because Jesus saw their actions. And his, uh, their actions then drove him to act in a certain manner. When Jesus saw them, he says he was indignant and said to them, what he's saying, Jesus does not take one for the team. He is not saying, because you are my disciples, I am therefore straight jacketed by your actions.
I always say to some of us here, whose side will we always take? Some would come to one hope and then find that the pastor is wrong and they'll want to take the side of the pastor rather than to take the side of Jesus. Others are straight jacketed because of their different theologies to say, whatever that my pastor says is true. Rather than them following Christ's example. Can we do the same also at home? I'm looking at the men. I always say this to the men. We spoke about it and said, is it an interesting, just as an example, Ahab and Jezebel in the Old Testament. Who gave Jezebel power? It was because he's a Syrophoenician woman. No. Ahab was a king on himself. So who gave Jezebel the king? Who gave Jezebel the power? Ahab. Central to that home was Ahab himself releasing the authority to his wife. So let's ask the husband, how do you release the authority that God has given to you? And why is it so? I always shock people. I say, hey, most of the time when people do so, especially most men, they do so. May I use this example again? Because they're trying to gain favor from their wives in that sacred place. Because if I go contrary to my wife, I won't be able to get to the sacred place. That night, or even for the next night, there's a big lock. Can't come in. And therefore, whatever will bring me entry into the sacred place, that's what I will bring. I therefore, I will not stand up against my wife. Parents do the same, right? Because suddenly there's four of them and there's one of me and I can't then take the stand for Christ. I can't take the stand for Christ. Because what society is wanting to dictate, even the church, right? We stand there. Take one for the team. Though we know that the stand that has been taken is incorrect, it is wrong. We don't take the stand. Taking one for the team. But this is not Jesus. Look at how he acts. He was indignant and said, that's his reaction. He is grieved and he is grieved with his righteous anger. Because from then onwards, they would then receive his tongue lashing. But now, here's the problem. You need to remember, what is the context? Earlier on in chapter 9, he had spoken to them, his disciples. Verse 35, and he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must last of all be seven and all. And look at 36. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking in his arms, and he said, whoever receives one such a child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. If you are studying the book of Mark, what Mark always seems to want to bring clear is that the disciples don't get it. They don't get it. And instead of us casting stones at them, they represent us. We don't get it. We don't get it. How then those from whom he had spent time amongst and he had demonstrated that children are acceptable, they can come. Yet yeah, they become gatekeepers. We are aware of what culture will do for you. And look at the tongue lashing. And it gives two commands. Two commands. One negative and one positive. Look at the positive one. Let the children come to me. He's saying, let the children be finding an acceptance to come into my presence. And that is a command. 
And it is in the command in the present tense. Meaning children are permitted to come into the presence of Christ. He does not just look at children as nobodies, as non-entities. To him, children matter. He accepts them as is. That is the positive command. Look at the negative. Do not hinder them. And he's saying, never put a barrier for you. For you must never put a barrier for the children to come to me. But what Christ wants to demonstrate, when they are accepted to in his presence, he therefore says, let them come. But by now, because he finds it acceptable, look what he does. He uses them now as an example. They become a picture. Look at the why. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. He says children are but a picture of those who would gain citizenship into the kingdom of God. Because children are nothing else but those who are dependent, those who trust him, those who are humble. And therefore anyone who needs to come unto the kingdom and belong needs to have the same attitude. He says, in the kingdom of God, what happens? Kingdom means God is the one who is ruling. It means God is in charge and in control. I always say, you need to know this about God. Either he's the one in charge and there's no one else. It can be you or I. What Christ says such an attitude, it is an assault on anyone and everyone who is still beholden to selfishness and self-righteousness. That's what Christ is saying. Those who come, this they need to get rid of. Because all of us at some point in time, we always want to be in charge. Or we think we do not lack. That's why we don't want to be submissive and we also don't want to be needful. We don't want to be submissive to Christ or any of his appointed authorities. We don't want to submit at home, we don't want to submit at school, we don't want to submit at work because we've got this type of attitude. We are saying with this attitude, we desire to live without an iota of personal self-sacrifice. I don't care. I'll do what I want. I won't sacrifice. It also happens in the church. No self-sacrifice. And once we are challenged, we despise any personal challenge for us to change. We don't want to change. And I'm saying to us by now, this is nothing else but a self-deception. This is nothing else but an illusion. The reason why we don't want to sacrifice, because we do not want to be inconvenienced. And we object to our motives being brought to the fore and questioned. If ever that you are to do anything, don't question me. Some, even in discipleship, I will serve Christ as I want to. I will serve Christ on my own terms. But Christ says, if you are to realize the text, it's clear it says to us, those who do not come with this type of attitude are nothing else but people who are sinful. But look at the next verse as it continues. After he says they belong to him, he says, 
after them being a picture, then he gives this statement of fact. He says, truly, I say to you. He is saying, take this to the bank. Bank it. Don't even think twice because it's not going to go wrong. What I'm saying to you is faith proof. He says you can't get around this truth. And guess who's saying it? He says, I am. It's Christ himself saying, take this to the bank. I am saying this. And then, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, says, shall not think. When he says wherever, it says whoever, right? Doesn't matter where you come from. Whoever. Doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter what your background is. Doesn't matter what age you are. Doesn't matter what number you are at home. Doesn't matter. Whoever. It doesn't matter where you grew up in a home that you were taught the Bible or not. It doesn't matter whether you were taught the Bible and did not follow it. It says whoever. It doesn't matter whoever, it doesn't mean whether your parents were godly or not. He says whoever. Whoever. And yes, in the negative, who does not receive the kingdom of God shall not enter it. He says, when you are coming, anyone whose attitude and disposition is not childlike shall not come into the kingdom. Not long about children. It's now about how and how, what is the manner for you to come into the kingdom? Who's there? Anyone. Anyone can come. Says, but when you come, you must have a childlike disposition. Because failure to do so, it means the welcome is taken away. No welcome met for you. And by nice, let's think about this. If it says the kingdom is to receive, it implies that the kingdom is real. The kingdom is now. The kingdom is not only about the year and after. For you to enter, you enter into the kingdom when now. Not tomorrow. So he says the kingdom is available, it is present despite. It's invinc- that it's invisibility. That you can't see it. It's there. So if he says you must receive it, it means no one is born in it. If no one is born in it, it means all of us, all people are born outside the kingdom of God. All. Nobody is born inside it. So if no one is born of it, it then means all of us to be part of it. There is a certain thing that God demands of you. It is this childlike attitude for you to enter. And if it is availed for you to enter, it means you enter not on your own terms. You enter because you enter by the grace of God and nothing else. There is nothing else that you are bringing to God so that you can enter. That's why I say you can't Point to your, what your dad did in the past. Everyone must enter. And for you to enter what you need, you need the gospel. Look with me. Just verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 15. You're in one book. Book of Mark.
This is when Jesus, there are multiple witnesses. When John, when Mark writes, he brings these multiple witnesses. He speaks about that. There is these things that are written. He speaks about John the Baptist. And he speaks about, these are multiple witnesses that talk about the gospel of Christ. And yet, when Christ himself as a witness, when he speaks, look what he says. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's how you enter the course. You must repent. Because the gospel is God's own power to save sinners. There is no other power availed for sinners to enter into this living kingdom. An eternal kingdom. A kingdom without beginning or without end. Because it is through the gospel that God demonstrated that indeed that Jesus is who he is. What did God do for him? He raised him from the dead. The one central truth of Christianity is that there is an empty grave. That's what we hold on to. And therefore, what he's saying is, by God raising him from the dead, it means, therefore, salvation is possible for people to come in. It is possible. And when, if you come in by the gospel, because it is God's own power. It means you have nothing else that you are offering to God. Nothing. Because you have no inherent goodness, by the way. You are born a sinner. Through and through. So if the gospel avails power, it means it eliminates all self-efforts. It eliminates all badges. What is the badge that you are carrying that you think that is what brings you into the gospel? What brings you into the kingdom of God? Some carry lots of badges because I did this for God in the past. No. We enter in the same way and we continue in the same way. How? By faith through the grace of God. Nothing else. And through the gospel, with the gospel are solved and it says all everything else is self-destructive. Receptive. You can't be self-dependent. You can't be self-reliant. You have to repent and believe on Jesus Christ by faith. Simple as can be. Trust him with all of your life. That's how you come into the kingdom. And what does it require? A childlike faith. Would you believe that you have nothing to offer him? And he says, through faith in him, it means you repent. And by repenting, you say, you have no other resources that you can rely on so that you can gain the gospel. Meaning, through repentance, you throw away all sinful thoughts, all sinful deeds, all sinful desires. Most of the time, we forget about the desires also. And when you repent, it means you fully accept Christ's evaluation. Because Christ, when you come to him, he evaluates you. He says, apart from you believing in the gospel, all that you are, you hate God. You hate God's son. You hate God's children. That's what you are. You are not born loving the church. Because the church are those who belong to the kingdom. And unless that you're part of the kingdom, everything about you, inherently, you hate God. Why? Because you were born that way. And by that it means you are indeed a son of Adam, born through Adam. When you repent, you throw away everything and you throw yourself at Christ. And that's how you enter into the kingdom. Because there is no other means for you to enter except by faith in Jesus Christ. But that's the condition, right? That's the condition of acceptance. That he says if you are childlike, that's the condition for the acceptance for you. But look at then how he acts. And he took them in his arms. And he takes them in his arms. You need to contrast his action to what his disciples were. What manner did he act? How did he act? He embraced them. When he embraces them, he says, Christ says, I have exception. I have 
affection towards them. They are accepted and they are welcome into the kingdom. And look at the action that he does. That was a manner. And he blessed them. He pronounces prosperity and favor upon them. These are not saved because of this. Because even children belong to the fallen Adam's race. What the text wants to make clear is that you don't enter the kingdom because you are a child. That's not what it's saying. You must be childlike. And for those of us who believe in a certain, what we know is that children, like all human beings, all adults, are elected. And therefore they still need to be regenerated and saved by Jesus Christ himself. Through the spirit. That's how we become saved. And this. He gives it to whomever he pleases. And because you have been accepted. It means you are incapable. Of coming to God. On your own. John 3 verse 3. Unless that you are born from above. You cannot enter the kingdom. When he says be born again. He says you must be born from above. Somebody else must birth you. And the one who must birth you, it's the Godhead himself, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit must bring you into the kingdom. And it is through the ministry of the word that even children need to come. But let's look at lastly the men. What does he do? He lays his hands on them. That's how he bestows his, his blessings on them. And we said, how? Laying hands and praying for them. That's what Christ did. I want to give you just two takeaways from our text this morning. Jesus wants us to know two things from the text. That the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, disciples must relate to everyone without status or prestige, if you are a disciple. It means failure to do so. It means you are tied to your spiritual pride and everyone's status you are forgetting is only granted through Christ's death and resurrection. That's number one. Let's look at the last one. Entrance and acceptance and continuance in God's kingdom is granted to all people with a childlike attitude, humility, and submission despite their age. Sometimes when we grow old, we become very stubborn. Though we have walked with God for a long time, our hearts are no longer malleable. We think we have walked with God for a long time. And therefore no one can tell me. Except that somebody takes you back to say, what do the scriptures say? And if you are to be one who is humble, you let go of your pride. You accept what the scriptures say. Because that's the attitude and disposition of the kingdom of God. It's not how much you know. Remember, we were saved through one man. Through the one who died, rose again on the third day. And I close by this. By the way, by now, when they act this way, Christ had already told them that he's going to die. And yet, they're still proud people. Isn't that us? Let me pray for us. We thank you, our Father. We want to bless you this morning. We thank you for your word. May you alone be glorified. In Christ's name. Amen.